Hello, friends. Welcome to 3ABN Worship Hour. My name is John Lomakang. I'll be your speaker for this hour. We always appreciate you giving us the privilege of coming into your home and sharing with you God's Word. Today, our message is entitled, Burn Your Bridges. Now, you may have heard that phrase in the past, and people say, don't burn your bridges. Well, today I'll show you how that phrase is appropriate when it comes to the Christian life, how important it is to burn your bridges. Now, you might right now be thinking, why burn our bridges? What if we want to go back? Well, let's ask for the Lord to guide our minds and hearts today as we approach his word with a solemn mind, with the understanding that as we listen, the Spirit of God will speak to us. Bow your heads with me. Loving, gracious Father in heaven, it is true that you are the God who guides us and leads us. And that leading is needed today more than ever before. We know that you have a plan for us that is far beyond our understanding, even our imagination, because you can do great and mighty and marvelous things. And so we pray today that you'll speak to our hearts, to the relevancy of the phrase, burn your bridges. And we ask for your spirit to do the surgical work in the hearts and lives of your listeners and your hearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to encourage you to go with me to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to look together at verses 13 and 14. The Apostle Paul, one who knows very well the difference between who he was and who he became, penned these words to encourage us that who we are and who we can become is significant. So significant that I cannot even put an estimation upon it. But listen to the experience in the words of a man who knows that there is a before Christ and there is an after Christ. Here's what he says in Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. In other words, I'm not there yet. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Now the personal responsibility. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There is a higher call than we have attained thus far. That's why Paul says, I do not count myself to have apprehended. In other words, I'm not there yet. But as the songwriter says, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. And I would suggest at the very beginning of my message that I make it abundantly clear what my intention is. My intention is that you begin to see the high calling that God has for you, the upward call of God that is awaiting you in Christ Jesus. Let's begin with an illustration that's a very real one. You see, when God led the children of Israel out of Egypt, I believe it was God's intention for them not to return. That intention is clearly supported by Scripture in Exodus 14, verse 15, because he gave a directive to Moses, and Moses gave the direction or the directive to the children of Israel. Look at the short portion of Exodus 14, 15. What did God say to Moses to tell the, to the children of Israel? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Not go backward, go forward. God intended for the Israelites to burn their bridges to Egypt. He said, go forward, burn your bridges. What does that mean? That means if you burn your bridges, you do something to force you to continue in one direction with a particular course of action and make it impossible for you to return to an earlier situation or an earlier relationship. Many of you are going back to where you were before, back to your earlier situation, back to your earlier circumstances. Some of you back to the same kinds of relationships. Why? Because you haven't burned your bridges. You have not made it impossible to go back. You haven't severed your ties so completely that it is impossible 
for your desire to be accomplished by your actions. Now, sometimes there are those who might say, man, I feel like going back. But if you burn your bridges, that feeling will pass because you can't go back. If there's no bridge to take you from where you are to where you used to be, you cannot go back. You see, friends, I believe that God is a burn your bridges kind of God. Because when the Lord led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he wanted them to burn their bridges to the lifestyle of Egypt, to the dress of Egypt, to the entertainment of Egypt, to the mindset of Egypt, to the character that they had as slaves in Egypt. He wanted total transformation. And so he said to them, go forward. Make sure that there are no bridges going back. And you know the story, but something happened. Something happened in their journey forward that indicated they really didn't burn their bridges as they should have. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through verses 10. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses and in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. So far, it's a great story, but it continues. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now, I wish verses 5 to 10 were not included. However, the Bible says, But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now all these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And verse 8, Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. And verse 9, Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Nor complain, verse 10, as, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Wow, what a record. This record is for those of us that live on the borders of the promised land. This record, I believe, are for those Christians that can look back in their rear view mirrors and say, wow, God has brought me a mighty long way. But don't stop there. For those Christians that say, and I'm not going back. I refuse to go back, and I'm going to burn my bridges. Well, as harsh as that definition may sound, I believe that we serve a burn your bridges kind of God. The Bible gives continual examples that God, in so many countless situations, wants us not to go back. Take King Jeroboam as an example. You know, the Bible talks about a story in 1 Kings chapter 13. Let me lay the foundation before we look at the scripture. King Jeroboam became angry when the prophet of God condemned a false idol. And he tried to arrest the prophet of God. And the king extended his hand, his hand to do harm to God's prophet, and his hand withered up. And when the prophet of God restored his hand, King Jeroboam said, you know what? I'd like you to come home with me. I want you to go back with me to my house because I want to show my gratitude. But look at what the Lord said to the prophet of God. 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. Look at that. But the man of God said to the king, if you were to give me half your house, look at this, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so... I was, com for so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, You shall not eat bread, nor drink, drink water, nor return by the same way you came. And notice what he said. Don't eat bread, don't drink water, and don't 
return the same way you came. Don't go back with him. Don't go back with him. And if you know the rest of the story, somebody came along and deceived even that prophet and he lost his life because God was serious. What is the point? When God takes you from where you were, the worst thing you can do, my brother or my sister, is go back to the way you lived. Or go back to the life you lived. Go back to the things you do. Go back to the dark practices that polluted your life at one time before God cleaned you up. There is no good in the past. That's why he said to the Israelites, go forward. When God leads you forward, he has plans for your life that you will upset if you go back. But God didn't stop there. You may remember the story when Herod plotted to take the life of Jesus. And he tried to manipulate the wise men to accomplish his dark purpose of killing baby Jesus. Matthew 2 and verse 12 makes it clear that the instruction was also applicable to us. Here's what the Bible says, Matthew 2 and verse 12. The Bible says that they should not return to Herod. They departed for their own country another way. When Herod said to them, when you find out where Jesus is, let me know so I can go and worship him. Wow, that's powerful. Some people today use worship to accomplish deception. Some people use worship to accomplish selfish intentions and selfish designs. But God warned the wise men, don't go back. Don't go back. Herod's intentions are not what you think they are. And the Bible said they listened and they went another way. You also find when conflict arose during the ministry of Jesus, it affected a large portion of his followers. Look at John 6 and verse 64. Well, look what happened to those that went back. The Bible says in John 6, 64, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. He knew, he read the motives of the heart. He saw the issues of their lives. He can tell by their looks and their smirks and their attitudes that they were really not into his messages. The Lord was very clear about the intentions, but what happened? Look at John 6, <clears throat> verse 66. And the Bible says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. That's a sad scripture. I thought it was fitting that it was John 6, verse 66. Many of the disciples of Christ went back and walked with him no more. You know, when I discovered that scripture in the Bible, it gave me comfort in my heart because I said to myself, if there are those that will turn away from Jesus, John, don't get discouraged when people would listen to your messages and turn away from you. It's not necessarily your message. It's the condition of the human heart. They went back and they walked with him no more. And according to that statement, there is no evidence in scripture that those disciples of the Lord ever came back. The Bible makes it clear. They went back and walked with him no more. You know, sometimes we get shocked when people join our churches and they endure for a short time. But when persecution and difficulty and trials arise, what happens to some of them? They go back. They go back to their past. They go back to what they used to think, what they used to believe. They go back to false doctrines they once walked away from. They go back to churches they once left because they, that church did not follow the scriptures. They go back to the life they once lived that they know is against God's will. They go back. But let me make a point here. If they burned their bridges, making it impossible to go back, they would have dealt with their frustrations in that moment, but they would not have gone back. You see, so many people make it possible to go back. They keep the trinkets in their houses that they once wore. They keep the jewels that they once wore. And they take it off for Sabbath, but they put it on during the week. They go back. There's some people whose entertainment, they have a certain entertainment on Sabbath and a different kind of entertainment during the week. They go back in their hearts. They go back. They go back to the lifestyle. They don't live a moral life. They go back. And all of these are the ways that the enemy wants to, de to defeat God's plan for your life. He wants you in thought 
action, word, or deed to go back. But as sad as it sounds in going back, it's even more serious than that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 19, verse 17. When the angels told Lot to leave Sodom, look at the command. Genesis 19 and verse 17. He said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. I don't know if you caught that. He said, don't look behind you. The Bible not only condemns going back, it condemns looking back. You see, looking back starts in the mind. Going back is when the heart embraces the thing that the people kept on thinking about. You know, that's why the songwriters, when they introduced these old songs, they said, uh, the golden oldies. Golden? That's when I lived my life in sin. We call that sometimes the good old days. What was so good about the life you lived? You are living in the goodness of the Lord now, but the devil wants you to think, and, and so we, li we listen to the music of five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, for some of you, even more than that. And we remember where we were back then. And for that brief moment, we smile because in a satanic way, we think of those as the good old days when in fact, those were the days when your life was on track to be lost eternally. That's why the devil is smart. He packages all the junk of the past. He lowers the price and he says, for $19.95, you can get 100 of your favorite songs of the past. And you think, wow, I want to embrace the past again. Oh, brother and sister, don't bring it into your house. Don't go back. Don't embrace the oldies. Don't embrace anything from your past. Don't go back and don't look back because both are equally condemned to Christ, by Christ. Look at Luke 9, verse 62. Jesus condemns both of them. He says, but Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Did you grab that? Not just going back, but looking back. And there are some, it's a sad statistic, I read the magazine, sometimes Christianity Today, and the sad reality is there are, in some cases, pastors leaving the ministry more frequently than they could, than they should. They should leave when they retire. But for whatever reason, the reasons are numerous. Some people decide, I'm no longer going to follow the Lord. I'm going back to what I did before. I'm going back to my former life. I'm going back to my former job. I want to tell you today, I don't want to go back to selling insurance, working for a bank, working for a law firm, working for insurance companies. No, because this is the career that the Lord has given to me. And you know what? It's not a career. It's a call. It's a blessing. Can you imagine getting paid to preach? Can you imagine getting paid to serve the Lord? Can you imagine what a job, what a call, what a blessing to go back to what? And some of you have come from lives that were just so destructive on so many levels but the enemy is very clever. He studies the way you think. He studies your dissatisfactions and he tries to incorporate ways in your thinking to make you start wanting the past before you begin to go back to the past. But here's a fact. Your feet cannot take you where your eyes and your heart are not leading you. Your feet can never take you where your eyes and your heart are not leading you. The scriptures make it very clear before we go back we start looking back. You know, this is something that has been a casualty throughout human history. And the Bible records that, not only the examples I've given you, but when the New Testament church began to grow, there were those that were ardent leaders in the New Testament church that lost their way. And the Bible records what happened so that it could be a warning to us today. The Bible gives us a glimpse into what happened to cause some of the ardent followers of Christ to go back. You just found out about the disciples, but listen to the story of a young man 
in the book of Colossians. Let's start with Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Let's look at his present and look at what happened tragically. In speaking fondly of his co-worker, the Apostle Paul wrote, Colossians 4, 14, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. He says, Luke and, and Demas greet you. He had two uh, partners in ministry that he spoke fondly of. But after Paul holds out the blessing of enduring to the end, he had something tragic to say about one of those two men that he just talked fondly about. Look at 2 Timothy 4, verses 9 to verse 11. What happened? Paul the Apostle writes to Timothy, Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Verse 11, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you. He is useful for ministry. He is useful to me for ministry. What a sad commentary. What happened to Demas? The Bible says he has forsaken the ministry, having loved this present world. And he went to one of the cities where all the pleasures he desired was there. If we could say that today, he went back to his Las Vegas. He went back to his New York lifestyle. He went back to the San Francisco lifestyle or L.A. or Miami or any major city for that matter. He went back to the way he was accustomed to living because he loved the present world. I've got to ask the question right now before I go any further. Is your love for the world greater than your love for Christ? Is your love for the things you once did greater than? than the things that God is giving you as a gift from his almighty heart. Where is your love greater for the things of God? Do you love worship? Do you love Bible study? Do you love opportunities to go to church? Do you go to Bible study prayer meeting on Wednesday nights or maybe when there's an evangelistic series? Or do you love your own private time? Are you, are you held in captivity to the things that surround you are you a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God? Do you love money? Do you love yourself? Where is your love? Because if any of those answers are against the will of God, you too will have the very same inscription about you that was said about Demas. Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. You know, friends, this world is fading away. Everything about it is one day going to be just a pile of ashes. There's nothing in this life that's worth holding on to. That's why you're going to see that the turn in the message is not about things, but it's about finishing the race. Heaven's agenda is that we finish the race. Hell's agenda is that we go back. And we're living in the day and age where the agenda of both divinity and, and darkness are being accomplished. We find that one of the signs that we're living in the last days is pointed out by the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. Notice what he says. And this is another sign. He says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. There are many people falling away today. They're falling away, and I want you to grab this, because they embrace the church in what it teaches. But to a large degree, they have not been changed. I'm going to say that again. They have embraced the 28 fundamentals as it is in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and all those fundamentals are right. They are the foundation for Christian living but something about them did not change. And that's why they ended up going back. Make no mistake about it. Satan is studying us with demonic intensity. He is examining the flaws in our character to determine the best strategy that he needs to use to get us to go back. He knows that leaving Jesus decreases the possibility of us going back. In other words, there is no such thing as once saved, always saved. The Lord may save you in justification, but if you fail to be sanctified, your corrupt heart unchanged, if all you have is a belief system and not a new life in Christ, then you can easily go back. 
That's why the Bible says, unless the falling away comes first. In the book, Councils on Stewardship, we read about how Satan is studying us. Page 154, paragraph 1. Notice the concern that Satan has. We read, as the people of God approach the perils of the last days, Satan holds earnest consultation with his angels as to the most successful plan of overthrowing their faith. Now that should make you sit up. That should make you more conscious and aware of what's taking place around you. That should say, wait a minute, wait a minute. What am I doing? Every now and then God sends a message to jar you out of your complacency. The question I ask today, though, is what do we do that may aid Satan in overthrowing our faith? And I think one of the problems with going back is we don't consider the dark forces waiting for us if we go back or if we look back. We think that it's going to be just as pleasurable Like the Israelites said, let's go back to Egypt. We had more fun there. We had more food there. We were comfortable there. No, they weren't. They were slaves there. But in their desire, you see, the Lord got them out of Egypt, but he had a hard time getting Egypt out of them. And that's why they began to look back. He saved them without any conditions, but they lost their lives in the wilderness. Why? Because when the Lord brought the conditions of entering the promised land before them, They said, I like it better when I was in Egypt. Wow. Consider what's waiting for you if you go back. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 44 and 45. This is a sobering scripture. Let's start with verse 44. Then he says, speaking about the spirit that came out of you, that the Lord rebuked your life from. Then he said, that is the evil spirit says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the Bible says, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. What a sobering scripture. What is being said is when the Lord rebuked the life, when the Lord cleansed a man, he got his life empty of all the wicked things that were there. And the condition was empty, swept, and put in order. You know, friends, there are those whose lives have been swept. They don't smoke anymore. They don't drink anymore. They don't carouse anymore. They don't live immorally anymore. They're swept. Their former behaviors and practices have been removed. And then they look the part. They look like their lives are, quote unquote, put in order. But there's a danger that they missed. The danger is they are empty. They are empty. The only safe Christian is one whose life is filled with Christ. The only Christian that is safe is one whose life is filled by the presence of and the abiding power of the Spirit of God. Why do I say that? Evil spirits cannot come in where the Holy Spirit is living. He won't allow him to come in. Evil spirits cannot evict the Spirit of God, but the Spirit of God can evict evil spirits. Oh, my friends, when I thought about that and I read about that, this quotation I'm going to share with you was a very sobering one, which gets us to consider the vitally important decisions we have to make to burn our bridges. Listen to this. Servant of the Lord wrote this. It's called Letter 53, a specific letter to a specific individual written back in 1876. And look at paragraph 27 with me. The intellect and affections you must bring under the influence and control of the Spirit of God. Your mind is so constituted that it will be constantly employed either for good or for evil. You have the power to train the mind and control its workings and to give direction to the current of your thoughts. That's the direction of your thoughts. 
Others cannot do this for you. You must do this for yourself. But to do this will call forth effort and toil. This work cannot be done by giving loose rein to the imagination. The thoughts must be resolutely and perseveringly brought into subjection, subjection to the Spirit of Christ. You notice the personal responsibility included in that quotation. There are certain things that other people can't do for you. Now, the simple things, they can't eat for you, they can't dress for you. No, you don't even expect them to, but something else they can't do. They can't make decisions about the direction of your thoughts. That's something you've got to make decisions about. We live in a world that influences us how to think. Social media, television, music, society. If you live in a bigger city, the more influences are there. Even if you live in a small town that just has nothing but fields around you of grass and corn, the influences are also there if you allow social media or any kind of media into your home. The influences are there, maybe through friends and associates. The influences are there. But here's the point. You don't have to allow influences to decide the direction of your thoughts. Somebody may make a suggestion, but their suggestion does not have to become your journey. What you see doesn't have to become the way you live. What you hear doesn't have to take on your character development. There are choices you have to make, and you are responsible for the current or the direction of your thoughts. You decide that. No one else does. You can hear something, but it doesn't have to become your character. Somebody could suggest something, but you don't have to embrace it. You are responsible for the character of your thoughts. You are the one that has to resolutely and perseveringly bring your thoughts into subjection to the Spirit of Christ. That's why Paul the Apostle writes these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Notice the first two words, powerful words. Here's what he says. Examine yourself. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Then he says it again. Test yourselves. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? What powerful phrases. Paul the Apostle should know because he had a horrible past, but what a glorious future he has looking forward to. He is looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. He said there's a crown of righteousness laid up for him. Why? Because he burned his bridge. He didn't go back. That's why he is qualified to say, examine yourselves, test yourselves. Far too many of us, I say this again, far too many of us are concerned with the attitudes of other people and not concerned with our own attitudes. Far too many of us are concerned and point out the flaws in other people's lives and ignore the flaws in our lives. Why? Because we don't have a spiritual mirror. We don't examine ourselves. We don't have a spiritual spotlight. We are not shining the light of God's word and examining ourselves by God's word. But I can tell you some of the most... Uh, some of the most difficult people are Christians who point out everybody else's faults and are ignorant of their very own. That's why, friends, if the character of Christ is not being developed in you daily, you are disqualified. We are no use to heaven and no threat to hell. If you are not developing the character of Christ in your life, you are no use to heaven and you are no threat to hell. What a neutral place to be. You don't have, you can't benefit either side. You are of no value because you are a meandering, you are in the maze that meanders, in the mediocre lifestyle. You are meandering, as I've said, in the maze of mediocrity pondering at the pool of popularity. There's no direction in your life, and that's why most rivers are crooked. Rivers follow the path of least resistance. If that's the kind of life you lived, then you will be crooked because you've made no determined plans to order your life after the similitude of Christ. That is why God has placed it on my heart to study intently developing Christian character because we cannot be saved if we are spiritually disqualified, 
Look at Titus 1, verse 16. He talks about the irony of Christianity. Notice what he says. How you live and what you say are not the same. Titus 1, 16. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and look at the next word, and disqualified for every good work. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, they profess to know me. If you talk to them, they talk about me. They sing about me. They go to my church. They live a life that looks like a life of a Christian. But there's something that you don't see. The Lord is saying, but in their works, they deny me. What they say and what they do are not on the same page. What I see is abominable, disobedient, and disqualified, and I can't even use them. They are disqualified for every good work. That's why the Apostle Paul once again speaks to this young protege, Timothy. He says, you're going to take my place when I'm no longer on the scene. Let me encourage you what you need to do, young Timothy. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, notice what he says. He said to Timothy, be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker that does not need to be ashamed. What? Rightly dividing the word of truth. He says to this young Timothy who's being trained by the aged Paul, he says, if you want to get anywhere in life, study to show yourself approved to God. Now notice, you've read that before, but let me emphasize it. Make sure that God approves your life. Don't concern yourself with other people because they can't see the hidden motives of your heart. But the God that is the one who offers you eternal life, he knows what's going on on the inside. If he sees that you are abominable, disobedient, and disqualified, he can't use you. So be diligent to present yourself approved to God. And then you will be a worker that doesn't need to be ashamed because you have now become qualified to rightly divide the word of truth. So the question is, how diligent are you about presenting your life to God and letting God rubber stamp your life? How comfortable would you be to say, Lord, examine me. You're not going to find anything dark. If you can't say that today, then you need to change the direction of your life. One of my favorite writers by the name of Oswald Chambers, in one of the books that I read very frequently, My Utmost for His Highest, May 10th, he says this very important phrase. Listen to it. He says, we are in danger of forgetting that we cannot do what God does and that God will not do what we can do. We cannot save nor sanctify ourselves. God does that. But God will not give us good habits or character. And he will not force us to walk according, walk correctly before him. We have to do all that ourselves. That's right. He will give us salvation, but God is not going to develop in us good habits. We've got to do that. You know, I heard the story many years ago about there was a time when children that were born left-handed, the parents would tie their hands behind their back and force them to be right-handed. And they would accomplish that. They would tie their hands behind their back until they learn how to write with their right hand. Because there was a time in history that people believed if you were left hand, you were possessed by some evil spirit. Strange ideologies. But the point of the matter is, they were able to train that child to use the other hand. Now, do we train dogs? Of course we do. Do we train horses and birds and animals? Yes. Do we train them to fetch? Yes. Or lie down or roll over? Yes. Stop, come, stay, run, jump. If we can train an animal and we are proud of animals that we train, how proud will the Lord be of us if we train ourselves to respond to the commands of God. The Apostle Paul was so clear about this because he looked at the putrefying life he once lived and he incorporated in his counsel all the things that we've got to do in order for us to come up to the character that Christ wants us to be. Look at Philippians 2 and verse 12. Beautiful passage. He says to us, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not, in, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Listen to this. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation? 
Is Paul saying, save yourself? No, that's, what, that's not what Paul is saying. Let me use a simple illustration. When I was growing up, my mother, the lady raising me, knew how to make cakes. She was good. She made homemade cakes. And I would be amazed and, and mesmerized because I knew that when she was done, that was going to be a good cake. But I watched something that I want to use as, as an example to, to illustrate what Paul means by saying, work out your own salvation. She would put the flour in. She would put the ingredients in, the vanilla extract, the sugar, the butter. She would put whatever flavor she needed in there. And then she'd give it to me and she said, now work, work it out. And there I am, a little boy with my, she will give me this big old pot spoon and she will stir it, stir it, stir it till it becomes creamy, stir it, stir it. And there I am. And I says, is it done yet? She said, no, keep going. And I didn't understand until I got older that what she was looking for is the consistency. She was looking for the, the nature of it. Is it getting smoother or is it still rough like it used to be? Christ is trying to get the rough traits out of our character. So we've got to work out what he worked in. And the question is, what did he work in? When we accepted Christ, he gave us the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, meekness, patience. And then he says again, such there is no law. There's nothing prohibiting how lovely and how kind and how, how patient you can be. But it says you got to work it out. What does that mean? You got to work on being kind. You've got to work on being patient. You've got to really desire to be a lovely person. You've got to be a person that wants to be long-suffering, not quick-tempered, not a bad attitude. That takes work. I've been a pastor 35 years, and ooh, there are days that I breeze past losing that temper in that moment. And I, Okay, Lord, teach me what to say. Teach me what not to say. Yes, it is a day-by-day -day work. Die daily. Work out your own salvation. When you do that, then Philippians 2.13 is true. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Because like my mother, God put the ingredients in us like she did in that pot, like she did in that bowl. And he says, now you work it out. Yes, you got to work it out. The work of changing our standing before God is what he does. That's justification. But the work of changing our behavior cannot be done without our participation. That's called sanctification. Throw the idea out that you're once saved, always saved. God doesn't save people that still curse and call him Jesus. God doesn't save people that still live however they want and say, well, I'm going to be saved no matter what. No, there's no conveyor belt of salvation. You got to become like Christ. He's not saving people that are rough and hard and, 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 and evil and mean around the edges. No. He's not bringing people in heaven that's going to fight against each other. You've got to be transformed. And God will begin the work and finish it. Philippians 1, 6, he who has begun a good work and you will complete it, but he will not complete it without your participation. God is not going to force you to be nice. You've got to choose every day what you want people to understand and know about you. And you know what? The more you practice being righteous, the more righteous you become in your character. Now, righteousness of Christ is what we call imparted righteousness. He gives that to you when he justifies you. But imputed righteousness is what he puts into your life day by day with your participation. In the book, Ministry of Healing, this quotation brings it out so beautifully. Page 176 in paragraph one, listen to these words. The tempted one needs to understand the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision, of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. Desire for goodness and purity are right so far as they go, but if we stop here, they avail nothing. Many will go down to ruin while hoping and desiring to overcome their evil propensities. What happened? They do not yield the will to God. They do not choose to serve him. Wow. They want to be it, but they don't want to make the effort to be it. I want to go to the store, but, but, but I don't want to go to the store. 
You got to get up off that couch, your Christian place of complacency. You got to get up off of the excuses of, well, that's how brother so-and-so is. And the sad reality is I've done so many funerals, but I've seen more lies than not told at funerals. We know that person was wicked and mean and at funerals people say, oh, he was so nice. Brethren, stop making excuses for things that can be changed while we have time because the very character you have when you die is the character that you'll have in the resurrection. You are not changed in the resurrection from evil to good. You are changed from mortal to immortal, from corruptible to incorruptible. But the character change must be made while we are alive. Look at Isaiah 1, verse 16 and 17. The Bible is very clear about this character change that every one of us must make. We must choose to do this. Isaiah 1, verse 16 and 17. Isaiah the prophet says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good. Did you get that? When he says, wash yourself, he's not saying, he's not saying, forgive yourself of your sins. He's not saying, put yourself in right standing before God. That's the work of Jesus. He's the one that says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But Revelation says, blessed is, blessed is he that keeps his garment, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. The same thing that fell to Adam and Eve, they lost the glory of God and they were ashamed. The glory of God is the character of God. And he wants that character to be in you and me. He wants that character development to be there so that people don't only say you sing like a Christian or you look like a Christian, but you behave like a Christian. You have the attitude of a Christian. People want to be around you because you're not angry and you're not short-tempered and you're not, you don't talk about people and cut them down behind their backs. No, you are the kind of Christian that sees in everyone a son or daughter of God in the making. As I've said to my church, we are saints under construction. That's right. We're saints under construction. One day we're going to be like Jesus because he promises to end what he began. He promises to finish the project. I'm a divine project. He promises one day I will be like him. But he says, maybe it, you don't look like me right now. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. That's 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. We will see him, see him as he is, but we've got to make pure choices. We've got to make pure choices. Cleansing ourselves, ceasing to do evil, learn to do good, means we burn our bridges. When we cease to do evil and learn to do good, we burn our bridges to the evil habits. We build a bridge to the good habits. And when we cross over into the good life, we burn our bridges to the evil life. That's why James writes these words. Look at this. How do we do it? James 4, verse 8. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know what double-minded means? Oh, should I tell him off or not? Should I go to church or not? Should I study my Bible or not? And James says, a double-minded double man is unstable in all his ways. Do not let that person think that he or she will receive anything from the Lord. Can you imagine living with a person that's double-minded? You want to ask them, which one of you is which today? It's like having a person with schizophrenia in your presence, not to belittle that at all. It's like having a person... Can I talk to you today, honey? Oh, great. You're going to be nice today. Oh, don't talk to me. I'm angry today. That's what the Bible is saying. You can't be a Christian and not behave like a Christian, yet claim the name of Christ. He wants the fruits on your branches to be the same as the fruit that comes from the nourishment that comes through the vine. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. He wants to see those fruits in our lives because it's the same power to transform us from sinners to saints under construction, but it's the same power to change our behaviors. Ministry of Healing, page 176. I love the way that servant of the Lord counsels us to do this. Years ago, Ellen White wrote this statement and how beautiful it is to point us to the efficacy and the beauty of what Christ can do in our lives. She says, 
God has given us the power of choice. It is ours to exercise. We cannot change our hearts. We cannot control our thoughts, our impulses, our affections. We cannot make ourselves pure, fit for God's service. But we can choose to serve God. We can give him our will. Then he will work in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus, the whole nature will be brought under the control of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? If we simply say, Lord, I want to be the, the child that you want me to be. I want to be your daughter. I want to be your son. I like to look at different examples in life. You know, my wife is a, is a product of England. She was born in Great Britain in Derby there in England. And anytime something comes on television or a magazine comes out about the royal family, she loves to read about the royal family because they are so royal. I mean, they, they ride in those expensive, timeless, priceless carriages, those those Rolls Royces and Bentleys that just seem to be so unrealistically long and stretched and so opulent and elegant. They just exude royalty. So many of us don't understand that we can exude royalty. We are a, holy na a, royal, we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's own special people. We are peculiar. We are special in the sight of God. And the king of kings of the universe wants his children to behave like royalty. That's right. He wants us to behave like royalty, but it's up to us. There's something that we can do to allow the royalty of heaven to be seen in our lives. And there are steps that the apostle Peter, who was once a profane man, has put together for us to understand the steps of sanctification. Notice, I call this Christian addition, not E-D-I-T-I-O-N, but A-D-D, you add all these things and you'll grow in Christ. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Here is the Christian addition, adding up all the qualities that Christ wants to be seen in our lives. He says, but also for this very reason, Peter says, giving all diligence, meaning you got to be serious, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, that's God's word, to knowledge self-control, don't be wild to self-control, perseverance, keep going, to perseverance, godliness, while you're going, let Christ be seen, to godliness, brotherly kindness, treat others the way they should be treated in Christ, to brotherly kindness, love, love them, don't just like them. And then he says in verse eight, for if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But look at verse nine. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, verse 10, brethren, be even more diligent. Notice that's your part, to make your call and election sure. And I love the way it ends. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Wow. Wow. Have you been stumbling in your Christian life? He says, because you haven't done what you need to do. You have left your Christian walk to chance. You've been content to just sing Christian songs. I love you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. Nothing wrong with that. But if all you do are Christian activities, you're still falling short of the glory of God. He wants the glory of God to be seen through you, not just on you. We can easily settle for hearing the glory of God rather than reflecting the glory of God. Oswald Chambers, in that very same devotional, My Utmost for Us High is May 10th, he continues and he gives us some wonderful counsel. He says, take the initiative yourself. Make a decision of your will right now, and I love this, and make it impossible to go back. Burn your bridges behind you. Now you know where my title came from. I was reading Oswald Chambers one morning and I embraced that phrase, burn your bridges. Yes, I don't want to go back to who I used to be. 
I want to be all that I can be in Christ. You know, I was in Zambia and in Zimbabwe a number of years ago. My wife and I were there with the Maranatha group. And the Maranatha group, we were building a project in Zambia. And then we, they said, today we're going to go to Zimbabwe. That's across the bridge. And this bridge is across the Victoria Falls. A massive earth shattering fall. This is a glorious sight so far down. But they said something to me that really is significant. They said, when you pass immigration from Zambia and you enter the bridge, you have now entered no man's land. I said, what do you mean no man's land? They said, you're not a citizen of Zambia and you're not in Zimbabwe. You are in neither. You are on a bridge. Really? So to what country do we belong? Neither one. So what do we do? He says, until you cross over to Zambia from Zimbabwe or Zimbabwe from Zambia, you are nowhere. And I thought, really? He said, you got to leave one behind you and press to the one in front of you. And that's why, friends, today, you don't want to be a no man's land Christian. You want to do what Paul the Apostle said in Philippians 3.13. The very scripture we began with, I end with these words. Where are you standing? Are you in no man's land? Well, here's my counsel to you today. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I have made the personal decision to press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, I have made that decision. I'm becoming a kinder pastor, more loving, more patient. Yes, I'm holding back my temper. Yes, I used to have a bad temper when I was in the world. I don't have it anymore. Well, I'm saying that slowly because the devil can hear me. By God's grace, every day I'm making decisions. And what about you? I encourage you today, make a decision to make it impossible to go back. Make a decision to burn the bridges from who you used to be and become who you can in Christ. God bless you. <laughs>